was here for the TED Talk for the weekend. I'm a purpose consultant for a company called Power of Purpose. We specialize in educating and mentoring nonprofits, um, which is really cool. I want to share this real quick. Our Bible Talk, a group of young professional single men and women, are actually starting a nonprofit in San Diego. Um, we're hope opening up a shelter for transitional age youth that are homeless. Um, so if you have somebody that, if you're interested in something like that, please come talk to me. I'll share with you our resources. Um, but we have found it to be really, really uh, encouraging. So my topic for the weekend was peace. And peace is an interesting subject because it's predicated on the concept of war. For peace to exist, there has to be some sort of disturbance. If there was no disturbance, there'd be no such thing as peace, almost like good and bad weather. In San Diego, we no longer have good or bad weather. It's just weather because it's 75 degrees almost year round. Um, so you guys can come out and visit. Um, you just may not come back. So um, there are many fights and battles around us that kind of disturb us. There's kind of a global peace that some people pursue. There's interpersonal peace or war between us and others. And I think sometimes we think if we could just escape, just get away from the noise and the people and the other people, then maybe we can finally have peace. Uh, but I think there's one peace or war that we can't really escape, and that's the war with inside of us. No matter how many times you travel, how far you run, there's always war inside of us. As disciples, we can't escape people. So even if we wanted to, uh, we would not be able to and still serve God. So if you went to the doctor and the doctor said, um, I hate to tell you, but you have a terminal illness. Now you could be healed by taking this pill. Well, would you take the pill? And hopefully, all of us would say, yes, absolutely. And the natural questions to follow would be, but how often and how long? And the answer today, and the challenge I give to you is, how badly do you want to be healed? Let's turn to James 5.16, the scripture, one of about four that I'm going to share today. We'll read this one. The other ones I'll reference for time's sake. So be prepared to take notes. Um, but these are the scriptures that a brother shared with me that really changed my life. It's a simple one, but it is where I have come to, found, come to find my peace and my freedom. James 5.16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I was faced with this question by a brother about two years ago, how badly do you want to be healed? I had come to him because I was at a place in my life where I felt like for eight years as a disciple, I had not totally been at peace with my walk with God. I've had the fortune as a disciple to travel to many places with the church and do internships. I've preached in front of hundreds. I've done poetry in front of thousands. And yet behind closed doors had an inner war going on in my heart because there was sin I was deliberately giving over to that I hadn't totally handed over to God. And I wasn't totally honest with the people in my life about. I didn't think after eight years there was gonna be much of an escape. So he told me, because of everything God has given you, because of the talents and the abilities God has given you, you will have to be more open than anyone you know for your pride's sake and for the sake of the people that you lead so that they don't think more highly of you than they should. And I probably shouldn't have been leading at the time, but I did in many ways. I thought every day was a little crazy. The brother I spoke with was, was known for being very radical about sin. So I thought, okay, every day is cool. I'm not gonna do that. Um, so I started confessing more often and way more vulnerably than I ever had. And it was actually really good but not quite great because I would still go months sometimes without confessing. And sure enough, I'd dive right back into my sin. So about July, beginning of August this year, so a year and a half since I was given that advice, I finally decided to take it. I gave myself a 90-day challenge that I'm going to give you. It was to confess my sins, all of them, every single day. I put a jar on my bed to remind me, and any day I didn't confess, I had to put $20 in the jar. I wanted it to hurt, 
and it did. I ended up missing eight days total. Somebody had a question after I gave this lesson on Friday. What did you do with the money? I think some of it got stolen because um, it was in a cup in my room. I don't know. We have people staying with us that aren't disciples. But um, the other part of it, I'm probably going to pledge to a teen to go to camp or something. Somebody recommended that I take myself out to a nice dinner, and that just seemed kind of uh, weird and wrong since it's sort of blood money. Um, but needless to say, uh, I confessed for 90 days, and here's kind of the, the uncomfortable part. When you read that scripture, you'll find no conditions on it. It doesn't say confess your sins to someone that you're comfortable with. It doesn't say confess your sins to someone who can help you. It doesn't say confess your sins to someone who knows you that you trust really well. It says confess your sins. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And I remember that first week really putting this into practice. I called that brother and I was like, man, I'm confessing every day, but I don't feel like the brothers in my house can help me. Like they're not offering a whole lot of meat and potatoes back. And he goes, where does it say that they have to help you? The power, the healing is in God, not in the person. The only condition is that they pray for me and that they be righteous. So in the church, hopefully you can just confess to almost anybody. Um, but sometimes that can be a hang-up for us. Well, I don't really know. The guy that I really trusted, he left. He moved to Virginia. I tried to call him, but he's busy. And, but you got about 100 or 200 of the brothers right here. The scripture is conditional on one thing, that we confess to someone who can pray for us. God does the rest. So the natural question, and I got this, I think, yesterday, is what do I confess and if you so daringly take this challenge, I'm sure you'll ask the same thing. Do I have to confess everything? And this was the second scripture that changed my life. Romans 7, you don't have to turn there, but this is the passage or this chapter where Paul is kind of letting us in on his wrestle. And he's talking through this like war inside of him that I do things that I hate. And the things that I really want to do, I just can't seem to do them. So what do I confess? In my mind, everything that sets itself up against God. Because here's the truth. There are things that go on in this mind that aren't very pretty, even on my best day, but it still happens. And I would deceive myself, and I have deceived myself for about eight years and still can do so, to think that just because I didn't want that thought, I didn't entertain that thought, I didn't really think it, that it wasn't me, but the truth is, is this sinful nature still is very real. It exists and is live and active. So, for example, I had a dream the night before I gave this lesson on Thursday night. I gave the lesson on Friday, and I had a dream that reminded me of my bleak past and my addiction to pornography. And I woke up, and mind you, that night I had actually confessed and prayed with a brother about my struggles for that day. So my heart was pretty free. My mind was pretty clear. And yet I had this dream, and I woke up, and here's where we face our opposition, right? We're tempted to think either it's God, some outside force acting on me, he's tempting me, trying to get me off my game, or something in me is wrong. Like, maybe I did have a thought that I didn't confess, and it's just, you know, going in there. And So I want to give you kind of two of my thoughts when thinking about opposition. If we go the route of Satan, that Satan was the reason why it happened, which I think he's very real and does tempt us. But if we go that route and we don't take ownership, we just kind of blame Satan, here's where I find myself in the same spot after all of it is said and done. Because it's a losing battle on two fronts. One, we're instructed to flee from him and to pray through our struggles because the truth is he's not going anywhere. This is his dominion. Righteous men for thousands of years have prayed and fleed and he's still there. Second reason why it's a losing battle is because he already lost. Jesus already conquered him. We're kind of just fighting and waiting for the end of this whole thing. So fighting Satan to me felt like an endless pursuit. And there was no resolution in that. But the second one was me. What if it's just my flesh? And this is where Paul is so great. He's able to identify this sinful nature but in my inner being, I delight in God. That's where I am with Christ, but I can't deceive myself into thinking just because I'm hidden in Christ, my sinful nature stopped existing. It's still very much real. And the beauty of that is one, it forces me to take ownership because wherever you stand 
on the debate of that dream, whether it came from Satan or from myself, there's two things that we can all agree on. Agree on. One, that dream was dark. Two, it did happen inside of me. And so I have to take ownership of it. So why do I confess? Because where there is darkness, wanted or unwanted, I have to take ownership and it must be brought to the light. And this is the third scripture that helped change my walk with God. And I'll reference it once again. First John 1 talks about anyone who says that he is in love with God or walks in light, but does not walk like Jesus did. He's a liar. God only operates in the light. So I used to sit there and wonder, confused, like, man, I'm feeling really tempted in whatever way right now. And sometimes, in the rare occasion, I could conjure up enough humility to call on God and still not be given the strength to get through it. And I would wonder why. So when I started this challenge, what I found is that when I took the time to actually think about my day from beginning to end, there were so many little pieces of darkness that would get me throughout the day, most of which I normally would deceive myself or ignore. For example, my dad went to prison when I was 12. So when I see fathers with their teenage boys teaching them how to throw a, a baseball or a football, even as a grown man, I can grow envious. Because that's the time I'll never get back with my dad. He was there for 12 years. So the whole second half of my childhood, I lost that. Some would say that's justifiable. Like that was a real pain. The pain is real. The sin is also real. It's still envy and I have to get open about it. When I meet people my age who make more money than me, a quick glance here, a quick glance there, an impure billboard, and I look away really fast and I would justify and go, I didn't entertain it. I looked away, but the truth is my flesh is still eating it up. And so day after day, week after week, my soul was being attacked by darkness. And then in these moments of temptation, I would wonder where God was at. God doesn't operate in darkness. So you might say, like I said, well, I'm not intentionally holding these things back. I just don't think about them. And that was my problem. I was too arrogant and deceived to think, one, that I had that much sin to confess on a daily basis anyway, but two, um, just being lazy and not taking the time to do it. When $20 was at stake, boy, I found so much sin on a daily basis. <laughs> I'm serious. Because I would, to, it's 1130 at night, my whole house is, is sleeping pretty much, and I'm about to go to sleep, and I'm like, oh man, either I wake somebody up or I pay 20 bucks. And I did commit to God that I was going to be totally honest, because, I mean, he already knows what happened, you know. So I might as well be honest with my brothers. And I was like, yeah, today was a pretty good day. Um, I know this morning, like, I was a little rash because I was tired, and then, the, and then this afternoon, and then, oh, and then. And it was just like, before I knew it, the brother was looking at me like, bro, did you have a good day? Because this doesn't sound very good. But the truth is just a daily fight. That is the daily battle. It hasn't gotten a whole lot better, to be honest. The truth is there are still things, when I go out into the world, that my sinful nature really enjoys. Whether I like it or not, my sinful nature does. I think a lot of times we think of peace as a mountaintop like something serene and tranquil, or, or a beach, which San Diego has both on either side of the town in 15 minutes of each other. So if you want to visit, you can do both. But <laughs> I think peace for me has often been found right after the war. It's still on the battlefield, bruised, and like some demons having been slayed. It's only peace when the opposition is annihilated. That's what confession is. You rob... Satan of all that power because he can't use it against you. It's like an eight mile with Eminem, that last rap battle. And um, I don't know if I watched it as a disciple before, so please have mercy. Um, but I remember that last rap scene. The reason why he won was because he took all of his opponent's power away by bearing himself. It's like, yeah, I am this. I am that. Now what? And the guy choked. I think it works the same way spiritually. We put Satan at bay when he no longer has anything to use against us. So what does this have to do with purpose? This is what everyone desires. 
Proverbs 19.22 says, What every man desires is unfailing love. Better to be poor than a liar. Here's the real power and peace through confession. By the end of those 90 days, I was fully known by God, which is always the case. I was fully known by my brothers, which is not always the case. And I started to understand how hopelessly unsavable I really was before God. But it, what, it's what Paul found to be true. I am a wretched man. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ, our Savior. I never quite had that before. But through all of that, through all of the confession for 90 days of things that I wouldn't even boast about with my friends in the world, things that I was very ashamed of, I was still loved by God and my brothers. I was still accepted, not tolerated, but accepted, and I still belonged. People are looking to be belonged, and they're looking to be belonged to. When we have this peace, we get to share it vulnerably, raw and uncut, with others giving them the freedom and space to do the same. I want to share a poem with you about my monsters, and then I'll be done. But I do want to challenge you with this question. How badly do you want to be healed? How peaceful do you want to be? The first day I decided to start confessing, I called the brother up and I was like, I'm gonna, it was just like 10 o'clock in the morning. And I was like, I'm gonna have to be confessing for hours at this rate, because this is gonna be a tough day. And um, he goes, you'll be confessing as badly as you want to be healed. This poem I did at Reach Conference, it's called Reach Up. And it's just my battle with monsters. It's kind of a fun play on all of our childhood monsters, but I hope you connect. Thank you for taking the time to listen. And um, whether you start in the new year or today, I do challenge you to spend some committed time to God, really being open before your brothers and sisters. This poem is called Reach Up. I tried to reach heaven. I stood at the edge of the Tower of Babel, just hoping to touch the hem of heaven's cloak, only to find that the air up there was too thin, so I started to babble and choke. That building broke. I tried to reach heaven. I stood anxiously at the edge of my seat, watching a horror suspense thriller that happened to be my life stuck on repeat, that happened to be my life stuck On repeat, scared of what the next scene would be, I slipped my feet off that seat, certain that the rope would catch me and finally set me free. I tried to reach heaven. I stood puzzled at the center of my garden, staring at that tree, trying to understand that how I ate the fruit of knowledge and still not have connection between the Father and me. I searched for words, but those got crossed, so I looked at the box, only to find dead center at the center of my heart. Jigsaw had cut a piece right out of my heart. My first monster saw it through, that this beast would have nothing to do with beauty. The ring placed on this Samaritan man's hand at the well was not for purity. I became married to chasing anything that brought pleasure like Jason. This predator preyed like a cougar in the silence of the lambs, ready as Freddy to pounce on anything that tasted close to sugar. This joker went from wild to Captain Hook to Frankenstein creeper that gave even me the jeepers, left a scar that couldn't be wished away even by Jafar, but all this time, God was never far. Out came his chainsaw as he massacred those demons. Like an alien, he reached down from on high and took hold of me. And with the jaws of his loving arms, he drew me out the deep. A blood sacrifice I needed to give, but he was no Dracula. He counted me spared and gave me his. And now I get to stand before you at this Mike Myers, unmasked, unafraid to show my face because my hero told me I don't have to be afraid of the dark anymore. What? I am an unworthy man. Even as I wrote this, I wrestled with how ungrateful I am. Tempted to remain in darkness, even though I've been set free, because the scariest mask to face 
has always been me. I have a form of godliness, but deny its power. Impurity, selfishness, and deceit have been my secret snacks for years. And my pride still does what my pride has always done best. It hid from me itself and the extent of my rest. Only after eight years am I beginning to understand what Paul said when he was the worst of them all. I truly am sinful beyond measure. So thank God for that hidden treasure. That he would reach down and turn this treacherous creature into a preacher, breach this heart, do a search and seizure, bleach the dark spots, and bring this dark life to a screeching halt. Thank God for his reach. He stretched down and I dug in, and the further I went, the more I saw my need for him. So be transparent. Walk in the light. Open yourself up because reaching up without reaching in is like going to a doctor for surgery and saying, please heal me, but don't cut in. So amputate that sin. Reach again, and I'll see you when we all make it to heaven. Thank you. Amen. I want to encourage you to take Lindsay's challenge, uh, 90 days of confessing. Um, and man, we are, we are hopeless, all of us. <laughs> and so, man, it would be an encouragement to know of brothers and sisters who are doing it together, who are willing to, to talk about their deepest, darkest secrets together, who are willing to take off the masks of the facade that we live by, really to live righteously and honestly. And so no matter where we are in our spiritual walk, I want to encourage you to take that challenge. Um, today, my, my short topic is on the, the uh, my short lesson is on the topic of destiny-defying decisions, defining decisions. We are all aware of this idea that our life is the sum of the choices that we make. What determines our destiny are the decisions that we make along the path of the journey of our lives. And this idea I've been trying to figure out how to put into words for the last uh, couple of weeks. And so if you can just bear with me and give me some encouragement and help me preach this, that would be encouraging. Because I've, I've, been, trying to figure out, I've been trying to figure out how to say this thing that I'm feeling um, and, and trying to identify what it is that, that God is trying to say here. Uh, because I think we all understand that, that when we're looking at the end of our lives, when we're looking at the, at the end, when, we, when we're at that last day and we sort of are waking up and we know there's one day left, that what we're going to be looking at is the accumulation of all the choices that we made along the way. Those things that changed our course. And really, what happens is that because we know that decisions are so important in our lives, there is a, a tension that builds when we need to make one. When you're in the middle of making a, a really important decision, there's this tension that you feel, isn't there? When you're deciding whether or not that you want to choose this brother or sister to marry, there's a tension you feel. You're going, well, should I marry them? Should I not marry them? You're forecasting your life all the way forward, and you're thinking, are they going to help me be where I want to be? And, and there's this paralysis of analysis that happens when we're trying to make decisions. We think about whether or not to keep a job or whether to change careers, and there's this, this feeling that, am I giving up too much by quitting this job, even though I really want to be over here? There's a paralysis of analysis. Maybe you make the pros and cons list. Maybe you're one of those guys. You're writing out all the list of all the things that you've done on the pro side and the negative side, and you just weigh them out, and at the end of the day, you just figure out which is a little more heavy, which can I be, which has the least uh, 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 that I'm going to, which has the least that I'm going to regret, and then I'm going to go with that decision. And we get stressed out when we have to make decisions because we understand that the sum total of our life are the choices that we make. The choices that we make will determine or not, will, will determine whether or not we feel fulfilled at the end of our lives. It will determine whether or not we have regret, whether or not we have our true passion, whether we found that. And we all have this keen sense that our destiny, again, is de defined by the decisions that we make. And so each question brings this mounting stress. Should I go back to school? I'm getting a little feedback here, William. 
Should I change careers? Should I move? Should I stay in my own house or should I buy a new house? What kind of job do I want to do? Who will I marry? Who, what type of person should I pursue in marriage? If I get married, how many kids do I want? Five is way too many. <laughs> is three enough? <laughs> what should I do that's going to bring my life meaning? Should I stay at my current job? Should I look for more career opportunities? Should I sell my house? Should I become a missionary? Should I do that? Should I enter the mission field? Going, I have these three options. They all seem good. Which should I choose? What church should I go to? Should I keep coming to this church? I don't know. Every decision we make, there's this tension that we feel because we're, we're, we're sure that ultimately our life will be defined by those choices. And so what has happened over time is that we get this paralysis that we're like, I'm not even sure what to choose. I feel unqualified to make a decision. And maybe you've asked a lot of people. Maybe that's the, the route you go. You say, I'm going to ask as many people as possible, and whoever lands on the, on the positive side, whoever lands on the negative side, that's what I'm going to choose. But what ends up happening is that confuses you even more. Because you're like, should I value that person's opinion? And everybody has an opinion, and the opinions are often very strong. You're like, should I quit my job? One person's like, absolutely not. And another person's like, totally, you have to do it. And you're like, I don't, I don't know what I should do. And what happens is that as we approach every crossroads in our lives, there's this stress that mounts. Because we understand that the significance of our life, the calling of our life, is based on those choices that we make. Destiny-defining decisions. When you're at a crossroads, what should you choose? I know there's a tension, and I think we all feel it. And if you're here today and, and there's a decision that, that you're about to make, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you feel it right now. There's, there's a feeling that maybe, maybe what I'm about to choose is wrong, or what I'm about to choose is right, and really I need some more guidance. And if you're like me, you've probably gone on your knees and you've prayed, God, make it totally clear. Lord, make it clear. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear God say, move to India. <laughs> I'll sell it all <laughs> to move to India. You know, I want to hear it, but it doesn't seem to happen. And what happens is that all those little things develop and, 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 and mount stress on us and maybe build some frustration like, man, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'll ever make the right choice. And so I wanted to give you three things that I found through the scriptures, three questions to ask yourself that I found through the scriptures that I believe will always guide us to a place where God wants us to be. And you say, well, that's a lofty thing. Well, Take it for what it's worth. This is my opinion based on what I've read in the scriptures. But the very first question, I've changed them from yesterday, but the first question is, oops, the first question is, first question is, <laughs> will he be with you? If you're about to make a choice in your life, you're about to choose a crossroads, the first question is, will he be with you? Exodus chapter 33, you can go ahead and turn there. Here in Exodus chapter 33, we find Moses at a crossroads. Moses is the leader of the people of Israel, and they've been wandering in the desert for 40 years, waiting for their new homeland. Because there's an issue. Over the 40 years, wandering Israelites over and over again have, been proven their, have proved their disloyalty towards God. And so after several warnings, God appears to Moses and says this to him about the people of Israel. We're going to look at, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 33, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave these people, leave this place, sorry, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you, and you will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you. Because you are stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. Here, Moses is on a crossroads. Is that a crossroads? There are two options. You can stay wandering in the desert or you can go to the promised land. Moses is left with a choice and this is the way he responds. Verse 15. Then Moses said to him, 
if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? First question, will he be with you? If you're trying to make a choice in your life, the first question you can ask yourself is, will God be with you in that choice? Will God be with you in that decision that you make? You see, what God teaches the Israelites is that he will not go with them because they are stiff-necked people. It's because they have been sinful people. He, God does not want to be near sin. And so what he basically says to them is, because you are sinful people, I will not follow you. And it, what it helps me understand is that if there is a decision before us that is sinful, anti-God, against God's word, against God's will, God will not go with us. And so for us, it's a very clear choice whether or not we should go there too. If God will not go with me, Moses says, if, God will not, if God's presence will not go with me, then I will not go. I will not choose a direction where God is absent. If God is not with me, I will not go. And you look at this, and you can say it, it would be easy for him to think, well, why not? God almost gives Moses permission. Don't you see that? God says, you can go. You can, you can go. He says, you will have victory in this land. He even says that he will send an angel before them. That would be awesome. Imagine God said in your ear, I will send an angel before you to clear out the path of that decision that you're trying to make. I'm going to send you, you're going to be assured that there is victory. But what he says is that I will not go with you. See, what Moses understood is that you can succeed without God. You, you can succeed without God. You can be very, very, very successful. But without God, you will never have significance. I mean, with, without God, you can be successful. You can have a great career. You can say, God, clear out the path of that career, and God will clear it out, and now you'll have a great career. You can make a lot of money. You can be rich. You can get married. You can even have good-looking kids who then one day get married. You can live the American dream, two cars, two kids, picket fence, and it all. You can be in the best schools. You can get asked to go to Harvard. You can reach the highest heights. You can get in shape and look athletic. You can be good looking. You can be successful without God, but you will never, ever, ever have significance without him. There is no significance to any decision that God is not at the center of. There is no significance to any decision where God is not present. There may be short-term success. There may be an illusion of joy. But there will never be long-term fulfillment in any journey where God is not at the center of. And Moses understood that. And it made his decision very easy. You know, I will not go into that promised land. I will not go. Even if I want it, I will not go there because you will not be with me. And I think what has happened in life is that sometimes we make our choices based on our own ambition, based on our own desires, based solely on what we want or what we feel or what our culture has told us is right to feel. And we've made those choices without thinking, well, what, in what choice will God be present? And what happens is that we are stuck in places, stuck in a rut over and over again, just spinning our tires because we have found we are just grasping at joy. We have tried to reach it over and over again, but it has completely eluded us. And some of us are living in the consequences of some decisions that we made when we thought, you know what, I'm going to go where God is not. I'm going to go where God is not. I'm going to get that divorce even though God says I shouldn't. I'm going to go ahead and pursue that relationship even though God says I shouldn't. I'm going to go after that, that big house and that material thing that I really want even though God says I shouldn't. And we've gone after it, reaching for joy and reaching for it, and it has eluded us because God was not at the center of it. See, Jesus tells us that he has come to give us life that we may have it to the full. The best case scenario in our life is when God is at the center of it. Why would I want to make a decision where God is not present? 
Why would I want to pursue a career where God is not present? Why would I want to go after anything where God was not present? A good friend of mine, Ryan Javion, he moved from here. You may remember him. He, he did a communion one time, and everyone gave him a standing ovation. <laughs> he was awesome. Um, he was a great high school football player. And after high school, he got a, a really, uh, he worked, uh, rather, he went to, to college on a scholarship to Wake Forest. And he was one of the captains of the, of the team and played really well. Um, he, he was trying to get into the draft, into the NFL draft, and he worked out and had private workouts and was really hoping to get into the NFL draft, and eventually it didn't happen, but, but he felt like his dreams were squashed there. But then he got a phone call from the New England Patriots. And if you know anything about football, they're like, I'm not even a fan. They're the greatest team ever. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> I'm a 49er fan. My team is the worst. Uh, so, but anyway, they're, they're an amazing organization, an amazing team. And he was asked to come on not as a player but as a scout, which was part, I mean, what an amazing opportunity. And so he worked there. He moved. He packed up his belongings, moved to Boston, and, and was working there. And, and a couple of months ago, he came to visit. And I said, bro, how's it going? How's it, how is it being a New England Patriot? And he said, you know what? I quit the job. I said, you quit the job? He said, you know what, I, I don't think I could have been a Christian and worked at that job. You know, I tried, but I was missing meetings with the body. I wasn't able to share my faith with anybody. They, they really told me I wasn't allowed to talk about God in the, in the workplace. He said, you know, I was missing Sundays, and, you know, I, I just, I couldn't be a Christian and work there. And I thought, you know, this is a job that any of us who like football would have taken in a heartbeat. Like, if I got a call right now as I was standing on stage... <laughs> Like, I might, be, I might be tempted to walk off and join <laughs> Bill Belichick and crew. <laughs> but, but to hear a man with deep convictions and say, you know what, I can't work there because God is not present. That's incredible to me. And I wonder how you're making decisions. Are you making decisions with this as your primary question? Are you making decisions with this as your primary question or is your primary thought what I want? what I desire, what I need, what I think is best, what other think is best. You know, God is very clear. He has come to give us life and so that we can have it to the full. And so the best chance to have significance in our life is to be where God is. First question, will he be with me? Second question, what has he given me? Or what has he given you? In Matthew chapter 25, verse 15, 13, you don't have to turn there, Jesus tells a parable and I want to read it to you. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14, it says, Again, again, it will be like a man going out on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the servants returned and settled accounts with them. What has he given you? What has he given you? This, peril, this parable shows us that God has made an investment into his people. A portion of God's incredible wealth has been given to each one of us. God has given us life. He has given us family, relationships. Some of us, he has given wealth and homes, talents, gifts, children, time, strength, creativity, abilities. And each of us have been given a portion of God's incredible, enormous wealth. And what verse 19 says is it says that God will come back and he wants to settle accounts with us. So God has given us something, and now he wants to settle his account with us. And if you read the rest of the story, what you'll read is that God looks at the person who gained five more bags and says, well done. God looks at the person who gained two more bags and says, well done. And then God looks at the man who dug the hole and put his money in the ground and says, you are a lick wicked and, a licked and lazy servant. <laughs> A wicked and lazy servant. We're laughing about God's word. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that we are, 
that you are a wicked and lazy servant because you dug up this thing, this treasure, you stuck it in the ground, and you put it away. What God is asking is a question that I asked a couple of months ago, but what have you done with what God gave you? What have you done with what God gave you? God wants to know what, what you've done with it, what you've done with the wealth he gave you, what you've done with the opportunities he gave you, what you've done with the riches he gave you, what you've done with the, with the relationships that he's given you, what you've done with the family, with the creativity, with the skills, with the resources, with the opportunity. God, at the end of time, will come back and say, okay, what did you do with what I gave you? And so when we're thinking about making choices in our lives, the decision that we're making, the first question is, is God present? Is God going to be with me? And then the next question is, okay, what are the opportunities? What are the abilities that God has given me? When we're deciding whether or not to marry that sister that is so beyond our league, the question is, what has God given you? <laughs> and you think, amen, she loves me. I'm going to go for it. <laughs> As long as it's within the framework of what God has already allowed. When you're thinking about going back to graduate school, and all of a sudden you've applied to a bunch of podunk schools, and then you apply to, you know, Yale, and they call you back and they say, we want you to come. You think, could I have gotten that by myself? No, that's probably from the Lord. Let me pursue that as long as it's within the framework of God's will. What are the talents that you've been given? What are the relationships? You, you, what has God given you? What has God given you? You know, I, I've noticed this about people, that we are never as fulfilled as when we're using our gifts. That you're never as fulfilled as when you're using your gifts. You look at people who are singing, and they love singing, and they're just dancing and shouting, and they're moving. You know, you watch Betty Sparks up here, and you get encouraged. You're like, I want to sing like that, because she's using her gifts. Now, if you went up here and started singing, it would not be as good. But it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's, in, it's encouraging to know when people use their gifts, they just they feel so fulfilled. They feel fulfilled when they're using what God has given them. And so why not? Explore the things that God has given you. Why not make decisions after you've decided, after you've looked and determined based on Scripture, whether they're all biblical, why not use the thing that God has given you? Now, I was talking to a brother who was, he was a great photographer. He's from a different state, but he's a great photographer, and he was deciding whether or not to continue his career as an accountant or to pursue photography. He was doing photography on the side and was sort of making enough money to survive, um, but but he was he hated his job as an accountant. He didn't even like numbers. He was like, this is like the worst. I feel like every day I go in and I'm a zombie. I finish the day, I leave, and I'm just a zombie, and I feel like I just can't give any more. And on the weekend, he just he did photography, and so an opportunity came for him to make it his photography career full time. And so he was deciding, you know, he was going to make a lot less money, uh, but he could still survive and, and do it. And so he he called and he asked me, you know, what do you think I should do? Like, what, what should be the choice I make here? Should I pursue this photography thing or should I pursue this accounting job? And I thought about it a lot and I just, and I responded to him and, and I was like, look, what has God given you? What abilities have he given you? He, he was more creative than anybody I've known. I thought, why not pursue an opportunity that you've been given? Now, some of us may say, well, that's, oh, that's not very wise. You know, you can make more money as an accountant. But, but really, when we run the rat race of our lives, do we really feel fulfilled? When you're just doing the same thing over and over again, do you really feel fulfilled? Now, again, we have to build ourselves within the framework of God's word because God's word says if you do not work, you do not eat. So think about that. <laughs> think about that. But, man, we have an, if we have an opportunity to use our passions in life, why not go for them? God has deposited, deposited those things in you, and God wants an account, so you might as well go for it. What has God given you? Second question, what do you want? Psalm chapter 37, verse 4. It says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. I love this passage of scripture because it speaks to this idea that God can give us the desires of our heart. 
that doesn't necessarily mean that God is going to give us what our heart desires. What it means is that if we live a spirit-filled life, God will change our desires into his desires. That God will break our heart for the thing that break his. That God will make our wants his wants. That God will man, man, like change our, our likes into his likes. You know, if you've been a Christian a while, there, there's been a desire. Like there, there, You begin to have a desire to do Christian things, right? Like at first, you were coming to church and it was just a dirge. You were like, I don't want to be here. And then all of a sudden, you were like, I love this place. <laughs> because God has changed your desires. If you've become a Christian, if you've followed the way of God, if you've been walking in the light, if you've been doing spiritual things, God is making his wants into your wants. And so those wants then can be trusted. Those wants can be trusted. Before I was going into the ministry, I spoke to Barbara Porter, and I was trying to figure out whether or not I should quit my job as a real estate, you know, something or other. I was a contract administrator for a real estate brokerage firm. Um, and, I, and Barbara asked me this question that I thought was just so profound. She literally asked me, what do you want? And no one, never, never, no one ever asked me that question. That seemed like almost a taboo thing to ask about our desires. You know, I was taught to sort of deny yourself. And I think that's right. We do need to deny ourselves, absolutely. But there is also this thing, like our wants have been given to us by God. And so she asked me, what do I want? And I, and I told her, well, like, I grew up always dreaming to work with the teens. When I was a Christian, when I was baptized, I thought, you know, it would be amazing to work with teenagers. It would be absolutely awesome. I dreamed of doing that. I, I felt like, man, my life experiences maybe could help. And, 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 and she basically said to me, Tony, you're a Christian, right? I said, I think so. <laughs> she said, you love God. You have a calling. It, it looks like you have some talents. If you want to help the teens, then go ahead and do it. You've been given the call, you've been given the talent, do it. If you're spirit-filled, if your mind is in the place of God, then do the things that God has put on, on your heart to do. Do what you want. At that point, if there are two or three or four choices that you're trying to make, destiny-defying decisions, don't get so caught up. If all of them, if God's will is within all of them, if, if it seems like all of them are, are useful for your skill set, then man, you can just decide what you want. Because those wants have been given to you by God. And seven years later, you know, I, was, I went in the ministry, and seven years later, here I am now. I'm not, I'm not working with the teens. But amen, if you start moving, God could change your course. <laughs> I went from the teens to the campus, and now I get to, you know, do this thing. <laughs> and I guess God had better plans, you know. It was just a detour along the way. Following the de desires of my heart, God directed my course. And sure, he can refine it. If, if we're starting to walk, walk in a path, God can determine our steps. God can move us. You know, there should be a freedom in making decisions. And that's really what I want to encourage you with as we leave here. There is a freedom in making decisions if you follow the biblical formula. If you realize that, oh man, you, you, as long as God is involved, you can use your skill set. And if your skill set is there, then you can just decide what you think is best. You don't have to be afraid of making choices. Too many times we get paralysis of analysis. We don't have to be afraid of making choices. As long as we're on the move, God will direct our course. So next time you're stuck at the crossroads of life, ask yourself, will God go with me on this journey? Am I using what God has given me? And is this what I want? Are these the passions I feel? Is the desire I feel right? And then go for it. At this time, we're going to segue our, our, our time into communion. And I think one of the, the scriptures I put up just gives me a great sense uh, of what Jesus came for. Jesus came, he said, so that he can give you life and that we can have it to the full. And that really is the, the feeling of all of us. I think often there's a desire where, where there's a feeling where we think that, that Jesus came so that our lives can be miserable. Or that Jesus, that the, the, the cross should be a time where we just reflect on the, kind of the, the worst of who we are. And I think there's a place for that. But there's also a place for us to rejoice in the cross because it made us the, the, the best part of us. There's a time for us to rejoice in the cross because we realize that he has given us the freedom to live. And so let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll sing one more song, and then we'll close with some announcements.